Okay, so the question is about Bob McChesney, who's a professor at the University of Illinois and was here early in the semester to talk about a book he's co-written that makes what some people would consider a very radical suggestion, although he would not frame it that way. So we know that commercial journalism, as we understood it, you know, in, especially in the post-World War II era, that is a news media that is overwhelmingly corporate and commercial, for-profit companies providing that journalism. That business model has taken a big hit in the last decade. And there are reasons, complex reasons for that. The most obvious one that's talked about over and over is the effect of the digital revolution on newspapers. Newspapers used to have a, a relative monopoly on certain kinds of advertising, especially classified advertising. What you see on Craigslist used to be in the newspaper. What you get on Craigslist for free, the newspaper used to be able to charge for. When that advertising evaporated, part of the revenue stream for newspapers evaporated. So these changes in the media landscape have had a real effect on the model by which commercial journalism was able to function for so long. There's, McChesney would argue that part of the reason those news outlets are in a fix is also because they've been greedy and short-sighted. That the 1980s especially saw a wave of consolidation and a concentration more than ever on profit over quality and that over the past couple of decades, journalism has suffered because of that. And when you put that trend toward increasing corporate concentration and more bottom line profit motivations. With the digital revolution, you get the collapse of contemporary journalism. Okay. McChesney's argument is we're never going back to a world in which for profit journalism can produce the news we need as a democracy. Therefore, we're going to have to talk about public subsidies. Now, on the surface, most journalists, and in fact, a lot of citizens, will say the government shouldn't be paying for news. We know what happens when governments create state news agencies. You get propaganda. Anywhere the government has a direct control over journalism, over the news, that journalism really isn't journalism, it's propaganda. All right. So in authoritarian states where the media is directly under the control of government, nobody considers that independent media. But what McChesney is arguing is that there are ways to subsidize media without giving the government direct control. And he makes the point that in the early part of this country's history, that was in fact done through the subsidy of postal rates for journalism. So remember that before television, before radio, everything was print. And when the United States was a developing country, most of the transmission of that print journalism was through the mail. Right? We were a small country spread out. And Newspapers and magazines were delivered through the mail, and the U.S. government subsidized that mail delivery by giving journalists extremely low postal rates. So what it would cost for an ordinary person to mail a letter, what it cost for uh, journalists to mail publications was much less. He said, so we have a history of subsidizing a vibrant public journalism, and we just need to think about ways to do that. And there are, in his book, a number of suggestions. Traditional journalists are very wary of that. It seems to me a perfectly plausible idea. But it also seems to me that public subsidies alone are not going to save journalism for a couple of obvious reasons. One is, have you noticed that in the con current political climate, there's not a lot of support for government spending on much of anything? So are you going to go to a public that, in political terms, is hesitant about any spending? and say, here's a, a new project we want the US government to undertake. It's going to be a hard sell politically. But even if you could create such subsidies, they're not going to be adequate to support. We're still going to have to have a, a journalism that is funded in a variety of ways. Some of it's going to be commercial. Some of it might be through a nonprofit mode where people give money to an entity like National Public Radio or other similar ventures and where public money is funneled to journalists in some way. The details of it are not easy to work out, but it seems to me it's going to be part of the mix if there's going to be a viable journalism into the future. Yeah.
Well, I think the most important thing is what everyone recognizes, which is the business model of commercial journalism is dying and dying rapidly. And I, I think that in the book what we argue is that uh, the internet accelerated the process and has made it permanent, but didn't create the process. The process, and I think the evidence is clear, began in earnest uh, at least a quarter century ago and accelerated during the early 1990s. Uh, and the problem ultimately is that uh, there's a conflict between the profit motive and the public service of journalism that became accentuated as news media became concentrated uh, in a small number of hands operating in largely monopolistic markets without direct competition, which made it possible for them to cut back resources to news throughout the 1990s, for example, while getting huge profits and not suffering because there was a competitor offering a better product. And I think that the decline of advertising in particular, which you've already referred to, um, is, is really something that's crucial because, because of the role of advertising in the last 125 years to provide between 60 and 100 percent of the revenues for news media, it gave us the illusion that the market would always provide all the journalism we needed and that it was a natural free market function. And what it did is it really masked the fact that journalism should best be regarded as having important elements of a public good. Uh, something that the market can't provide effectively for a free society and that the market uh, is really inappropriate to be the sole uh, dispenser of journalism. And now that advertising is leaving, the resources are dwindling, we're left with the stark fact that the market alone is not going to provide the resources to give us sufficient journalism. And that's what we have to face up to. It's got to come from somewhere else. I think that for most of us, and I think for me certainly, and I'm willing to bet every single person in this room, we were raised to think that freedom of the press meant the government should not censor with private media, should not censor what editors do, should not interfere with anyone's ability to start a private medium. And that's absolutely right. That's one half of the American free press tradition, but it's only half of it. The other half of the American free press tradition is that it's the first duty of a democratic state to make sure a free press exists in the first place, that you actually have a fourth estate. Otherwise, the freedom not to have it censored is a hollow freedom if it doesn't exist. And when you look back then at the first 100 years of American press history, prior to the rise of advertising in the late 19th century, what you see is that we had this spectacularly bountiful press system, much larger in a per capita basis than Britain or France or Canada at the same time between 1790 and 1875. And it was significantly there due to massive public subsidies put in place by the federal government, primarily postal but also printing subsidies. So that was how they saw it. They understood it was a public good. There was no notion in the early republic that the market would solve this. You just get out of the way and let entrepreneurs make money and, and the competition to make profit would generate this, a sufficient level of quality or quantity of journalism for self-government. That was an unthinkable idea until it began to be promoted by businesses when they controlled journalism by the late 19th and early 20th century. And I'll just add one point out of that of central importance. Uh, in doing our research for this book, we went back and we reread all the major freedom of the press decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court. Because I confess, I honestly thought that, of course, our Supreme Court, and I think probably many of you would have the same thinking now looking at the recent decisions they've been making, certainly the Supreme Court at some point in the last 75 years had said that freedom of the press was meant, the First Amendment was meant, that private businesses should control journalism and that their right to make profit was sacrosanct, and that was, the, that was the be all end all of the First Amendment. And what was striking to me as I reread the great decisions going back to the 1930s Hugo Black, Potter Stewart, uh, William Douglas was that in several of them, when the issue came up, they argued that it was the first duty of the democratic state to make sure you had a credible fourth estate. Otherwise, the entire constitutional system wouldn't work. And when I read those opinions in graduate school when I was doing my research, I never paid any attention to them because we had a viable press system. For better or for worse, you might not have liked the content. You might be critical, but we certainly had the resources for credible journalism. But now when you read Hugo Black in 1945 or Potter Stewart in 1971, and they write that, the words jump off the page. Mm. You had the, you know, the argument, in effect, is that the First Amendment not only condones public subsidies of journalism, it demands them. Mm.